Great. A very warm welcome to everyone today. My name is Ariel Molino with the Sankalp team. Um, I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya, and I want to welcome you all to this session, which is Corruption Eats, Impact Investment, and the SDGs for Breakfast. Let's change the paradigm. This session is hosted in collaboration with SITE, and our moderator, moderator today is Nechi Ezako, um, who I will hand things over to to introduce our speakers. So thanks so much for joining and have a great discussion. Nechi, over you. Thank you, Ariella. Hello, everyone. My name is Nechi Ezako, and it's my pleasure to be here with you all this afternoon. Uh, like Ariella just mentioned, our session is on impacting, impact investing and sustainable development goals. And I'd really like to read this topic because it is a long topic, but it is an interesting topic. Impact investing and sustainable development goals will always be sabotaged by corrupt ecosystems. But does this mean that companies should prioritize impact investing in favor of SDGs? That's the question that my panel is going to answer today. So it is my pleasure to introduce the team that are going to talk to, the, to, to this speak, uh, topic this uh, morning. Well, of course, depending on where you are, I'm joining the session from Botswana. So it is afternoon where I am. And uh, we have Lars Benson, the regional director from SAIB, and his profile is um, shared on the program. It's a very huge profile. But I'd like to say something interesting about Lars. You know, Lars was actually an extra on a, on a movie. How about that? You know, my professional colleague, Lars. And he was on a movie. That is fabulous, isn't it? So, and then, of course, we have Victoria. Victoria is from the BOI. And she's her profile is also shared with you on the program. And Victoria is going to talk to us from an investor's perspective. We also have with us here today, Baba. And Baba is my colleague at the ABIN, the African Business Integrity Network. And she's a, a business entrepreneur as well as a consultant that helps businesses. So she's going to talk, be talking to us from those two perspectives. Like I mentioned, I'm Nechi Ezako. I'm an advanced trainer with the Africa Business Integrity Network. And it's my privilege to be with you all this afternoon. So I'm just going to say a few words concerning our topic, and I'll invite our, our speakers to share their thoughts as I ask them a few questions. According to reliable data from the IFC, the African Union and others, MSMEs constitute 90% of African businesses. And of all firms, according to Lusigi 2022, they contribute 40 to 50% of the continent's GDP and 50 to 70% of its employment. MSMEs also contribute significantly towards achieving SDGs in Africa through employment creation, poverty alleviation, and enhancement of living standards, among others. Indeed, entrepreneurship has been described as the potential cure for Africa's problems, including inequality, low productivity, and disconnect from global value chains. Ibrahim and Andulem, 2022. However, despite this promise, Africa's small and growing businesses are threatened by an, env an environment of systemic and endemic corruption, which according to the World Bank, increases the cost of doing business by 10%. The IMF states that $1.5 trillion is lost per year on account of corruption. About $148 billion, or 25% of the continent's gross GDP, is lost to corruption annually, according to a statement credited to the African Union. And one in four citizens in 35 countries in Africa 
pays bribes for basic services, says Transparency International 2019. Yet, Africa's emerging markets represent the new frontiers of thriving businesses that foreign and local investors should ordinarily want to invest in, and good governance and corruption controls hold the promise of so much value for the African continent, including 400% increase in income per capita, according to the World Bank, $3, billion, $3 trillion growth potential under the AFCT CFTA, Baker McKenzie, and 300% increase in public sector delivery. Again, public sector service delivery, again, the World Bank. So what do you think? Now, before we go to this conversation by my colleagues and friends who are here today, let's take the poll. Lola is going to help us with this poll. Please, Lola, go for it. All right, looks like, okay, there she is. So please, um, uh, you can take this poll on your phone or whatever in, um, medium you're using. Just go to www.menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and use the code 23234580. Two three four five eight zero menti m e n t i dot com. Please use your excellent. There we are. We've got the first question. Could you please go ahead and put your answers? Yes, we have some. How does corruption affect returns? Financial, social, or environmental on investment. We have some responses coming in right there. Lack of trust, of course, inaccurate, suppression, non-factual, poor health, poor financial returns. Keep them coming. Please keep them coming. Okay, so our Mentimeter seems to have all these uh, in equal sizes. Aha, now it's coming up. Okay, so we can see lack of trust coming up. Thank you. Reduced profit margins. Yes, inaccuracy, poor health. Thank you, Lola. Can we go to the next question, please? Okay, looks like we've reached the end. Thank you. Thank you all for participating in that uh, poll. It looks like we had one question and not two, but that was nice, wasn't it? 
Okay, so now it is time to ask our panelists some questions. So we're going to have Victoria. Victoria, please, um, I'd like you to give a little background about yourself as you answer this question, because I like our audience to understand a lot better where you're coming from. So the question is, what are some of the challenges that an invest investment institution like yours faces in highly corrupt emerging markets. What are some of the challenges that an investment institution like yours face in highly corrupt emerging markets? Please go for it, Victoria. Thank you very much, Nechi. My name is Victoria Madedon. I work as the group head business development for BI Investment and Trust. It is a company owned 100% by the Bank of Industry. What I do in BIO Investment and Trust is to unhold and work through with uh, business owners that are either micro, small, medium, or large enterprises that are caught up in the difficulties of raising funds. In Nigeria, fundraising is a big issue. It is an issue globally. You have to be in a bankable position and you have to be legally structured. And most times, the small businesses, most especially micro businesses, are not structured enough to be able to access funding from institutions that are um, formal in nature, like the bank of industry. Having understand this fact, the bank decided that we set up a unit that works for these businesses and directly with them so that we can structure them and present them to financial institutions other than the Bank of Industry um, to fund their, their businesses. Over time, I've worked for the last 10 years with um, BI Investment and Trust, and we've been able to fund more than 7,000 micro, small, medium, and large enterprises. And the ripple effect is amazing because you see them grow from micro taking as low as um, 3 million, 2 million naira to becoming large enterprises that are having revenue drive of tens of billions of naira. That gives a lot of satisfaction. But I'll tell you something that it is way difficult to work with them because of the issues of ethics. A lot of businesses do not want to comply, not because they are not willing, but it's so difficult to even comply, to even access these um, regulatory bodies, to have a proper conversation with them without having to have a handshake that is not ethical. These handshakes, usually waste their time and causes a lot of disruption in their activity. As a micro business, you want to focus more on producing, manufacturing, or um, selling more, generating more revenue and driving your business, business rather than fighting or trying to meet up with um, regulators. Some of them outrightly forget to even file their annual returns. Some do not even know that they need to file their returns. Some of them don't want to pay tax because they believe that their tax will not be judiciously used. And for those that even want to pay, the time it takes for um, the tax people to come to them, to audit them, it's almost forever. So it becomes a daunting effect for those that are willing and also um, a reason to justify those that are unwilling to comply with regulatory um, uh, um, standards. Now, these affect the way we do business and um, help structure these businesses because there's a lot to be done at, at the micro level and the small, the small business level. Um, however, we have been able to work and, and curate people that can help them with their turnaround time so that they can comply and we can put them in bankable positions. 
It is mm. tough, but we've been able to find a way around it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Victoria. What you described su uh, suggests to me that there's a lot of risk around this uh, area of mm. business. How, what in your experience does BOIC do mm. to address the issue of risk in, in, in this regard? Um, so when it comes to risk, I mean, funding in itself, it's taking a lot of risk on people and trusting people that they will do the right thing. OK, but the truth is um, there are measures we have put in place to ensure that um, compliance is it's steady, you know, they, they, it's continuous, it's sustainable. One, two, um, in, in terms of um, repayment, there are also structures we put in place to ensure that these businesses are able to pay back. Thirdly, we most especially for the micro businesses, we ensure that they are insured because some of them do not understand the meaning of insurance. By year one, the bank pays for the insurance premium so that by year two, they begin to see the reason why they need to insure their products in transit or in the warehouse or during factory um, uh, production or in, insure their workers. Um, one of the things the bank has also done is you cannot get gross without including your employees. So um, employee health care is a criteria that the bank puts in place for micro businesses. So you need to ensure that your employees' uh, um, health care package is subscribed for on an annual basis. Because it's when they are happy that we are sure we can get um, repayment because they will happily work for you to repay back this facility. And having put all these um, regulators in a, in a box to ensure that these micro businesses are able to assess them, there is a level of a high level of compliance, which reduces our risk and exposure to unethical practices. And uh, secondly, there's the willingness to do it because the, the micro businesses do not find it time consuming as when they do it by themselves. Thank you very much, Victoria. I'm going to come back to you with a few more questions, but I want to turn to you, Baba, now. Hi, Baba. So um, as a business uh, owner, as an entrepreneur yourself, um, what, in your view, uh, is the role or how important is ethics and integrity to you? Oh, could you please unmute yourself, Baba? I believe, hello, can you hear me now? That's uh, We can hear you yes. now. Thank you, Baba. Thank you so much, Nechi, for this question. And it's it's almost this question sounds so, I, it's like I cannot even state enough. It's almost overstated the importance of ethics and integrity for small businesses. Because without ethics or integrity in small businesses, I believe we sink. And um, I believe that you spoke a bit about the losses that come to businesses due to corruption. Just the the very, very, very tangible, we're talking about the tangible monetary losses that come to businesses due to corruption, both internal and external corruption, and all that money. And I believe that the statistics say that about 12% is lost each year annually, internally, due to internal yeah. corruption. So let's not even talk about external corruption. We're talking about ethics and integrity inside your own organization and losing 12% is, is, is a big chunk of change. Losing just that much, that's revenue, that's profits, that's your bottom line, that's lost. And I believe that we are all in business to make money. 
And so even before we talk about all the other reasons why it's important, it's because ethics and integrity are good for business and they are good for our bottom line. And I think that once we start thinking about ethics and integrity as good for our bottom line, we, we, we understand the issues more and then we can move as, 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 as people and as business people. And apart from that, we really do have to talk about how ethics and integrity be apart from beyond even making you look good and that was my next point ethics and integrity make your organization look good you look attractive to investors you look attractive to partners and especially for organizations like us who are in africa and we deal with african organizations who are looking to partner with international organizations and to become vendors and third parties, you cannot not be in compliance with international anti-bribery and corruption laws. So there's a limit to how much you can even scale up your business and do international business and get foreign direct investment if you are, if, if you are a corrupt organization. And just to wrap this up, I do believe also that it makes you feel good, you and your staff. You can hold your head high, you can hold your shoulders back, and you have that confidence when you're going about your business, trying to transact business with other people, bidding for business, because you know that when they come in to look into your books, everything is in order. And so these are some of the things that make anti-corruption, ethics, and integrity so pivotal and so important to small and medium businesses. Thank, thank you so much, Baba. So how, how can one uh, identify um, small businesses that have ethics and integrity, because I, I can see that you know if you even looked at that poll, the result from the poll, you saw that they were um, the part participants were identifying some key things that were of concern to them regarding uh, where there is a lack of ethics and integrity or where corruption is a norm. So, how do you identify an organization that does have good ethics? and integrity in operation. Thank you, Lola, for sharing, um, putting that up again. Thank you yes, so much. Mama. And it's, 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 it's very interesting because it's almost like this Mentimeter poll has answered the question. It's like we can all tell. And with corruption, with ethics and integrity, it's, we, have, we have a proverb in Ghana, and it says that you cannot teach a child the supreme being. And it's sort of the meaning and the sense of it is that the sense of being, the sense of the fact that there's a supreme being is ingrained in all of us. And that as human beings, we all know that there's a higher power. At least that's what the proverb is alluding to. And in Ghana, we use it to say most of the time that most people have an internal compass of what's right and wrong. And so even before you are told that this is corrupt, you have an idea. And so you can tell, first of all, to me, and especially in the line of work that we do, I think it's so obvious, you can tell, you can tell, and it's all the opposites of this, these things that have been posted in the, in the poll. Are they transparent? Do they have high financial return? What's their cost of doing business? Do they suppress certain people? Are their costs increased? You can tell, and you can also tell from the tone at the top. It's very interesting. Once you walk into an organization, you can tell because from the, from the head of the organization right down to the very last person, in your interactions with them, you can tell. Apart from all these intangibles, and I think Lars will talk more about that, that's why also we have SIPE has ethics first. And so you can tell by, do, do you have policies and procedures about gifting? Do you have policies and procedures about procurement? Do you have whistleblowing facilities available? How is your reporting like? There are specific, apart from the fact that you can tell when someone is corrupt, there are also specific metrics by which we can, we, we can, we can, we can determine if a, an organization is corrupt or not. And there are so many laws, the FCPA and all of these other laws, that by looking at them, you can tell whether you are in compliance with being corrupt or not. Thank you, Baba. Thank you very much. Now that you've uh, called out Lars, I'm going to ask mm -hmm. our extra in the movie Forest Gump. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to be asking <laughs> Lars a very professional question. Uh, I wouldn't have asked him for his lines in that movie. So, La Lars, given its mandate of assisting democracies around the world through development of thriving businesses, 
What is SIPE doing to improve the investment climate and reduce corruption? Perfect. Thank you, Nachi, and thank you for the opportunity to introduce uh, SIPE. Um, so SIPE has been around for 40 years, um, starting in 2023, and uh, we're now working in about 80 countries around the world. Um, specifically in Africa, we're, we're currently in about 20 countries. SIPE is approach to fighting or reducing corruption is really from the business perspective. Uh, we have a lot of uh, laws in different countries around the world, and most of them are generally pretty good, but perhaps not properly implemented. We have regulations that try to sort of guide um, as rule makers uh, how business is being done, how investment is done in different countries. <clears throat> so Sipe's approach to this is, is sort of saying we need a to approach corruption from the angle of, uh, from the business perspective in terms of what are, how can we reduce corruption? How can we make corruption not profitable for people to engage in? And we can do that really by a lot of uh, ways, including self-regulation, um, by adopting different management systems, by improving corporate governance, um, by taking on responsibility and, and demonstrating leadership uh, within communities and within economies around the world. Um, so SIP specifically has been working on this issue for years and years because, as we all know, um, corruption is either the cause or the result of poor governance. And one of the things that we want to do in terms of building a better democratic world is by essentially uh, working specifically on the issues of, of what companies can be done and sort of trying to understand the environment, especially as we were talking about the sustainable development goals in terms of how we can help achieve those sustainable development goals. And, uh, and so at specifically at SIPE, we've done two things or three things or four. Um, we have on the African continent uh, created, and, and it's been referenced before, the Afri Africa Business Integrity Network. And this is a uh, group of about 60 people of which we have uh, all three or all two of you are, are part of the Africa Business Integrity Network again. And, it, and it's made up of individuals that actually provide uh, services to companies in terms of helping them improve their ethics and integrity. Uh, we also have something called the um, Africa Business Ethics Conference. We hold this annually, and this is really to highlight and showcase what business is doing well in terms of trying to uh, support and reduce corruption. Um, and finally, we have uh, a new uh, initiative called Ethics First, and this we'll talk a little bit more, I'm sure, in, in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lars. Thank you. Yes, so I am going to be asking you, taking you up on that promise that we'll talk a bit more about ethics first, because my very next question is um, actually pointing to that. What is the purpose of ethics first? How does it help in uh, to de-risk investments in uh, into Africa? Perfect. So if we go back to the Mentimeter and we're talking about uh, sort of uh, some of the issues that people raised with corruption, uh, one of the main uh, or one of the more common words that people were using is lack of trust. So what Ethics First promises to do is, is going to be creating a ethical African uh, database of companies and I'm actually going to leave and put in the chat, if uh, one second, uh, the link to uh, to ethics first for everyone. <clears throat> so it's going to it's going to create a um, a listing of ethical African uh, companies. We're going to do that to essentially build trust. Uh, to build trust uh, between companies and their suppliers, to build trust between companies and their investors, to build trust between companies and their governments. Um, what we what we plan to do is essentially ethics first. In the end, is about collecting and verifying business uh, due diligence data at scale, where we can uh, really complete a repository of all of the um, 
all of the information the companies need in terms of satisfying investors, satisfying banks, satisfying uh, potential international suppliers. Um, we also are going to help companies really manage risk by giving them some of the tools and the information that they need in terms of, of really improving their own internal management systems uh, to reduce opportunities for corruption. And then what we hope to do is also to create a database that is going to be very attractive to many members in this room, hopefully, about where they can go to identify potential companies that they might want to work with or invest in, in terms of, uh, in terms of being a better or safer bet in terms of being able to, to uh, uh, make investment decisions. And uh, we have uh, recently launched this within the last year, and we're uh, seeing some impressive uh, results already in terms of that. But we welcome more and more companies to join us uh, to become part of Ethics First, because the premise is, in the end, building trust between the companies themselves, their suppliers, their customers, governments in terms of potentially procurement. And finally, we hope to, to build that bridge and that bond between companies and, and potential investors. Ethics First is designed for SMEs. Uh, it's designed for smaller and medium, for entrepreneurs, companies that are perhaps uh, starting out, because we know that more larger and more established companies uh, frequently already have some of these risk management systems already in place. So what we're hoping to do here is help uh, sort of move companies along their risk management process so that they can build systems and build procedures and policies and demonstrate the leadership both internally and externally to help them uh, become more ethical and, and with a high integrity. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. Thank you, Lars. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take you up a little more on, on ethics first because I really think it's a huge answer to uh, some of the issues that we're discussing here today. Um, so how, how is Ethics First useful? I know you've talked about how it's useful from the perspective of the MSMEs. In, it's very clear. I mean, once they get on that database and they, they're able to move from one stage to the other in terms of um, de being de-risked or being uh, ethical organizations that can join a, a global value chain, that immediately um, kind of opens the door for them. I, I, I mean, it's, it's quite easy, I believe, for many of our uh, participants to see that. I'd like you to speak a bit more from the perspective of, an in, of investors, investment companies. Um, what, is, what is the need for them? Um, clearly, I'm sure that they can find um, ethical companies to work with, but do, is there a room, for instance, for them to join Ethics First, or how does it work for from the perspective of ethical, uh, of investment companies, and of course, from the perspective of banks and uh, larger companies that might be looking for um, uh, um, suppliers, maybe, or uh, contractors or other partners, and then, of course, from the perspective of governments. Uh, could you uh, tell us a, a bit more about what's how Ethics First works with all these. Perfect. Thank you, Nechi. So in a couple of different ways. Um, the first way that Ethics First can, can potentially help investors in terms of assessing some of their potential customers um, or partners <clears throat> is that I remember some of my previous experience on the continent. Um, I actually was uh, trying to set up a couple of deals and we had... Uh, found and, and, and really gotten to the handshake um, in terms of starting to uh, potential new business initiatives. But then what ended up happening was that the, uh, the investor decided, well, didn't decide, they were started to re request and require a lot of documents um, from the investee and this ended up delaying, uh, in one case, uh, the deal up to six months. Uh, in another case, it actually uh, resulted in the deal not going forward. And that ended up in, in, in a year. And what was the delay? The delay was some of the due diligence documents that were being requested were not readily available. 
these companies were startups. They had a uh, had found a great opportunity, but they really did not have the systems in place to be able to present some of the documentation that was needed for some of these multi million dollar deals. Um, so this is one case. Ethics First can help reduce that time between an investor and an investee uh, being able to include a, a transaction. The second reason is we, what we heard in, from the Mentimeter in the beginning as well. It raises the cost, and from you, Nechi, it raises the cost of doing business in terms of operating in emerging markets that are highly corrupt. <clears throat> and so what we want to do is to increase profitability of, uh, for ourselves as, as investors and potentially for uh, the companies that we're working with, whether they are startups or whether they are small or whether they're large or medium. And so what Ethics First is, is actually doing is sort of demonstrating. It's not saying the companies in the end can't or don't in, uh, engage in corruption. That's not what it's saying. What it is saying is these companies do or do not have management systems in place to reduce risks of corruption. So this is de-risking an investment on the continent or, or any of the companies that are listed within Ethics First. And then finally, as we were talking about companies being at different stages of development, especially uh, startup companies and newer companies, the type of companies that uh, at this conference, you know, we've been spending a lot of time talking about. Uh, what, we're, what we're really suggesting here is that uh, even if we find the most ethical leader or owner of a company and whether they are uh, ensuring and setting up these systems, what we are potentially doing through Ethics First is guiding these companies in terms of international best practices, international standards that will, again, help them better set up process, policies, procedures, and systems to help reduce opportunities for corruption and theft and fraud within their own uh, firms. So an investor, in terms of joining us, in terms of this initiative with Ethics First, can do a couple of things. They can do essentially uh, give a comparative advantage to the firms that they're working with by, by promoting Ethics First and by encouraging Ethics First in establishing a company that is uh, from the get-go going to be operating uh, based on ethical uh, practices and can demonstrate those ethical practices. As we, as we like to say, it's not only you know, saying what you're going to do, we're going to operate ethically, it's being able to prove it. And this is what Ethics First is all about. Thank you very much, Lars. Thank you. So I'm going to uh, ask um, Baba uh, very briefly. Can you tell us, uh, given all that Lars has said, from a uh, member of Aben's uh, perspective, how are you supporting um, small businesses uh, to meet the requirements of Ethics First or to uh, meet the requirements of being part of the global value chain? For us, it's it's quite simple. Um, we do that through our consulting work, through our training. And so um, how we do that is we consult, we hold clinics, and we help small businesses to um, get listed on Ethics Fest. And after Ethics Fest listing, we take them through the training that's, that, they are re that, that is required to ensure that their listing is verified. And so that's what we do. And through the ethics fest is so thorough that by the time that you are done being going through all the processes that you need to go through to ensure that you are listed on ethics fest, you do have a very comprehensive compliance program. And interestingly, we are actually working with a client, Wangara Green Ventures, and they do investments. They invest in a lot of green um, organizations and green SMEs in Ghana. And one of the things we are doing for them to ensure investment readiness and also the ethics and compliance of the companies that they are going to invest is that we are putting all their companies through Ethics Fest. And so right now we are collaborating with them to list all the to list Wangara Capital itself as the parent, as, as the investing body, and also all the companies that are in its portfolio are going to go through Ethics First and are going to go to an Ethics First listing. This gives Wangara Capital the peace of mind to know that every company that it's working with is ethical, it's compliant, and there'll be sustainability in the long run because things are in the place that they are supposed to be. 
And so it's just basically a very simple process. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Baba. Well, um, our, our guests may not know that that means going from green to silver and then on to gold. It is yes. a process and it's quite thorough indeed, like you said. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. And I'm um, back to you, Victoria. Um, how can impact be scaled, impact, um, impact investing? How can it be scaled and leveraged to create even more opportunities that enhance, um, you know, the the environment, kind of create a better environment for S SDGs from from the investment, you know, going from one investment, um, impact investment, and then making sure, using it to create the room for more SDGs to be achieved in the process. How, how, how can this be done from your experience or from the experience of those you have in, engaged with? Okay, um, I'll, I'll say one thing. Um, SDG goals, and ethics are one, you know, they're, they're together. You can't separate them. For you to achieve the SDG goals, that means to a large extent you are ethical because you want to ensure that um, people have the right um, employment. You want to ensure that livelihoods are improved. They have access to water. So you have to be ethical for you to um, achieve the SDG goals. That's one. For impact investment, I'll tell you something. Um, the truth is there are a lot of people who want to invest, impact investors, who want to come into the ecosystem, most especially in Nigeria. But because of documentations, you know, because there must be compliance. And, and a lot of micro businesses and small businesses are not compliant. And this is one thing that is affecting um, impact investment in the country. Even when um, they take the risk to say, you know what, let us invest in you and hopefully you will comply along the way. Maybe with more money, you'll be able to comply or um, with more visibility, if we create that for you, you'll be able to comply. They still do not, are not able to comply. And that in, in, in holistically, it's a, it has a ripple effect on how these SDG goals are achieved. Um, you, you want to invest, in, say, in a green field um, that has to do with um, biodigesters, hypothetically, right? You need an environmental impact assessment to be done to see how does this affect the environment. When, when you finish digesting um, this waste, where do you send the water to? Yes, it is organic, but at the same time, the fluid that comes out from this digestion process, right, this, uh, this um, anaerobic process, where do you empty it into? And how does it affect the groundwater? A lot of investors want to know this. And some of um, those micro businesses or these entrepreneurs, they do not know that they need to carry out these environmental impact assessment um, as, as a prerequisite for getting funding. So the, the, it's, it's one and the same. You, you cannot get um, good funding or sustainable funding if you do not have... Um, you do not comply with the, the regulations and you're not ethical in your process. Um, some investors, in, most especially in the agricultural sector, for us, we're interested in fair trade. If we're funding, if we're helping you raise fund from, um, for your aggregation business as a commodity trader, we want to know how you are paying the farmers that you are aggregating for. Are you being fair to them in your pricing strategy? These are some okay. things that we need to we need to put in place. So we need to find out. We need to understand how you how you re remunerate these farmers. Do you wait for them to be desperate before you uptake from them, or do you uptake from them regardless of the time and season? Do you uptake just to store so that you can? sell more and make lots of margins. Of course, that is the reason for going into business. But are you strangulating the, the, 
uh, a rural farm are you being small fair? Old, uh, are you doing your fair? business fairly exactly fair. so if you're not doing your business fairly in terms of pricing mm -hmm. and you're only looking at um your profit margin um as a capitalist mm -hmm. then you do not look at the, the the overall good and for us social impact is it's important um when um uh, raising funds for for any business that we're working with okay thank you thank you for that but but i think that uh, lars and Saip have actually answered or offered us the solution to that problem because really that is the issue that this conversation is about are we going to say that because there is corruption that there should no longer be impact investment are we going to say that the sdgs that impact investment actually helps to develop in africa and also to uh, uh, to build on for others to build on and other and um, um, a growth to happen should not happen because there is corruption I think that SIP uh, has given us the response to that by being proactive and taking a stand and taking some steps to actually help to de-risk investments into Africa by helping to make organizations much more ethical, taking definite steps. So I think that what we need to then do is how do we begin to partner with SIP's ethics first as investors and in order to make sure that um, the big businesses, the global businesses are actually able to leverage on the business potential that Africa offers. Because the truth of the matter is that Africa does offer huge business potential. I want to thank my panelists. Thank you for these conversations. But before I finish thanking you, we're going to throw the, uh, the, the, the question up to the uh, participants. I'm sure they may have some questions or some comments. Can we have those coming through now? Um, can we have some indications? If you have any questions, you can actually post the questions on the chat. And um, we will take those very quickly. And I believe that's the modus operandi. And while we have that uh, coming, I, I don't want to distract us though. I haven't seen any questions yet. Questions, comments, please feel free to send your questions and comments to the chat box, please. Thank you. Nechi, I'd love to hear from the participants themselves, which I'm sure many of them are either entrepreneurs or they are uh, working or investors, um, specifically how they are reducing risk or deleveraging risk uh, with regards to some of their investments um, that they're making, particularly with entrepreneurs. You know, this, this would be great to hear. Um, from everyone. And if not, if uh, one of the things we also can do as we're waiting for some questions, um, we can also consider taking a second poll. I think Lola has. Yeah, well, yes, she has. I was actually thinking about that, but I didn't want to distract the participants from the questions they are typing while they are doing the poll. So we have a question, and um, the question is from Sari Pali. I'm not going to attempt to answer to pronounce the second name. Can we adopt a better legal system on property, a codified law, transparent and trustworthy, adopted for the trust, professional bodies, etc.? Need may be a common oversight body. Okay, maybe there's a, a common oversight body might be needed. I think that's what she's trying to say. So the question is, can we adopt a better legal system on property, a codified law that is transparent and trustworthy, that the trusts can use, the professional bodies can use, 
and maybe there, be, there might be need for an oversight body. Does anyone want to attempt that question? Lars, you perhaps? Yeah, so one of the things that SIPE has been doing is we work on something called the Property Rights uh, Scorecard, which uh, takes a look. Uh, it's been in partnership with a, uh, another US NGO, and it takes a look across the world at property rights in, in different markets. Um, going back to the question, you know, property rights includes a, a many different uh, and multiple um, values and and uh, and systems and 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 in terms of trying to come up with one codified property law, I don't think we would be successful. We have different legal systems around the world. It would be very very difficult. But what we can do through the property rights scorecard is begin to take a look across uh, I think fourteen parameters um, in terms of how free and what are the property rights uh, in terms of, of the reality on the ground to essentially begin to address some of the challenges as it relates to property rights. I always think back when we talk about property rights, uh, they go back from everything from inheritance to uh, to how do you address uh, property rights in the informal economy, uh, specifically, how do you address property rights? As we well know, that women in the in many countries around the world um, have been, you know, excluded from having uh, rights to property. And if we talk about wealth creation, in the end, uh, it goes back to, to this issue around property. So I welcome everybody to take a look at that. The other second part of that question, though, goes to something that's I think very very important. And so the, what we're talking about here is professional bodies. And so whether we're talking about surveyors or realtors or um, other professional bodies, I mean, it, typically we're talking, when we take a look at them, they, they all have codes of conduct, ethical standards that they have to do. They have really a self-regulation mechanism in place to try to um, to improve the ability of their members to deliver services as it relates to property rights. And what we're also talking about here is self-regulation. And I, for one, and many of us at SIPE in terms of uh, really working around the world in terms of free markets, is, is a big believer in the ability of organizations to self-regulate their own industries. They're the closest to the professional bodies, whether we're talking about accountants or realtors or uh, surveyors. They are the closest to the individuals. They understand what standards are need to be met in, in, in a changing environment or even in, in terms of investment. Um, the professional bodies are generally the ones that should be the ones that are regulating the members and ensuring that their members are practicing uh, ethically and with high standards. And, and defining what those standards should be. Thank you very much, Lance. And the, uh, Lola has shared um, the link, so everyone can go there of the property um, the property rights scorecard. So please do feel free to um, take advantage of that as well. That information. Thank you, Lola, for sharing that. And and then she there's also a question in systematic systemically corrupt environments, is it possible to achieve scale on an advancing business integrity and business ethics? If so, what do stakeholders need to prioritize? Okay, I see you nodding, Baba. Do you want to take that? Oh, okay. I think you're muted. I can take it. <laughs> Please go I ahead, Baba. It. Yes. And I'm sure that Lars will probably have more to add because I mean he's a he's a he's a boss where this is concerned. But I for know, me, right? I was just nodding and saying, yes, this is ethics first is to achieve scale and collective action. And yeah. the whole goal of ethics first is to get as many people as possible to sign up and to join our movement and to join in saying that yes, we can be ethical, yes, we can be. We can have integrity. And the more people actually join and the more people sign up, the more that we can leverage on that scale and that collective action and demand better, better accountability, better, better results, 
better anti-corruption and better integrity from the business community and even the governments. Because we, while we are saying that we are concentrating on ethics in the business community, it does. We do have dealings with governments and the ruling system of the day. And if yes. there are more people in the business community signing up for ethics first, together we can make demands and make things yeah, better. Absolutely, yes, that's the power of collective action. Thank you so much for that, Baba. Thank you, yeah, our, our time is actually drawing to a close. I think we probably have time for just one last question, if there is one. If not, can I ask my panelists to give their closing remarks? Can I start with you, Victoria? Please unmute yourself. Just um, Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I would say that being ethical, it's critical to get um, funded. And it's also critical for the survival of your business. Being ethical, it's what we need in Nigeria for businesses to have continuity. The only reason we are not having um, generational businesses is because there's a breakdown in some ethical values in our organization. From this day, we believe that Partnering with SITE, which I am going to have the further conversation with Lola and this, we will be able to drive more businesses and, and put them in um, ethical yes. positions in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you for that, Victoria. And can I ask you, uh, Baba, to please go, go give us your final remarks? Well, uh, for me, I'm very happy as a member of ABIN, the African Business Integrity Network, to hear that Victoria is going to have some further conversations with Lola about partnering. And so my last words to everybody here, especially in our audience and in our participants, is that it's either we partner or we perish. And we do have this beautiful tool that can help us in solving this problem that is obviously on each, each person's heart. In this, in this, in this, in this session. So please reach out to us and find out how we can help you and how we can we can all solve this problem of business inter integrity and corruption. Thank you, Baba. Thank you. And you, Lars, your final words, please. Unmute, please. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. So if we go back to the the whole purpose of the Sankalp uh, conference, it's really talking about how do we promote entrepreneurship. How do we create impacts and how do we achieve the sustainable development goals? And, you know, to reiterate what, uh, what everybody has been talking about at this conference and, and what this session is all about, it's about partnering together. It's about building trust. It is truly about working together. Um, and in this case, it's about working together to help small and medium businesses achieve and develop the systems that they need to be successful in business over the long term, not just one time. And so when we talk about impact investing, when we talk about uh, investors uh, trying to manage risk and to make decisions on where they should go, I would say in the end, let's invest in ethics, let's invest in integrity, and let's move on together. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to say a very big thank you to you, the participants in this program and to my wonderful panel you gentlemen and gentlemen and ladies have been excellent and one last word from me is this i believe that as we take ethics to the businesses one business at a time will begin to create a culture of ethical business in our communities and with that thank you everyone and this is us signing off thank you for being part of this session God bless you. Bye now.